there's some areas in which Satan wants you to believe the wrong thing because to believe the wrong thing will lead you to do the wrong thing. The devil really had rather have you believe the wrong thing than to do the wrong thing because if he has you believing the wrong thing, there's no difficulty for him to get you to do the wrong thing because the thought is the father of the deed. You sow a thought, you reap a deed. You sow a deed, you reap a habit, sow a habit, you reap a character, sow a character, you reap a destiny. And it all begins with the thought life. For over 50 years, pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers preached to audiences and touched lives all over the world with his unique brand of solid biblical teaching. His teaching has been described as profound truth stated so simply a five-year-old can understand it, and yet it still touches the heart of a 50-year-old. And you'll hear that in these messages on the basics of the Christian faith. Have your Bibles ready and join us for today's message. Before we begin, remember, you can follow along with Pastor Roger's outline and notes on today's message at lwf.org or the My LWF app. Now, let's join Adrian Rogers. Would you be finding uh, Genesis chapter 3, and that's easy to find because that's the first book in the Bible, just three chapters over. And when you found it, look up here and let me tell you that the world's biggest liar is Satan himself. Jesus pulled back the veil of darkness from the kingdom of Satan, and Jesus said in the 8th chapter of John, the 44th verse, that Satan was a liar from the beginning. Jesus said that Satan is a liar, and he is the father of all lies. In that same verse, Jesus said that Satan is a murderer. That's John 8, 44. And so in that verse, you have both Satan's motive, which is murder, and Satan's method, which is deception. Now, his motive is murder. The devil is a killer. The Bible says the thief comes but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Satan wants to bring death. He wants to bring physical death. He wants to bring spiritual death. He wants to bring eternal death. He wants to bring death to life, to love, to beauty, to joy, to happiness. Satan is a malevolent murderer, and his method is the lie. He wants to deceive, to depraved, and to destroy. And uh, what we're going to find here in the third chapter of Genesis is the first lie that was told upon planet Earth, actually a succession of lies, four of them, that we're going to talk about that he told to Eve so long ago. Now remember that uh, Jesus said of Satan, he is the master liar. And so you're going to find as we look at these lies that they sound a lot like the truth. Because the, the cleverest lies have some truth in them. Every good lie has some truth in it. Even somebody as wise as said, even a clock that doesn't run is, is right twice a day. Isn't that right? But uh, the, the cleverest lies sound the most like the truth. And you're going to find these lies here in in uh, this delineation of what Satan did so long ago. And not only is Satan the master liar, uh, but he is, he lies about the biggest subject. The biggest subject is God. Now, to be wrong about God makes you terribly wrong, horribly wrong. The devil may not uh, care about some lies. They're not all that particularly important to him. But there are some areas in which Satan wants you to believe the wrong thing because to believe the wrong thing will lead you to do the wrong thing. The devil really had rather have you believe the wrong thing than to do the wrong thing because if he has you believing the wrong thing, there's no difficulty for him to get you to do the wrong thing because the thought is the father of the deed. You sow a thought, you reap a deed, you sow a deed, you reap a habit, sow a habit, you reap a character, sow a character, you reap a destiny. And it all begins with the thought life. So Satan had rather push a lie than he had to push narcotics. 
Satan is a liar. He is the father of all lies. He is the master liar. He is the cleverest liar. He lies about the biggest truth, and the biggest truth, the lie about the biggest truth is a lie about God, and that is a lie that does the greatest damage. Now, why would Satan lie about God? Well, A.W. Tozer said this, and he so wisely said it, no religion can rise higher than its concept of God. And so you're going to find as Satan first comes into history, as we see him here uh, described in the third chapter of the book of Genesis, you're going to find these master lies. And may I say that this is not just simply ancient history. This is not what Satan has done. This is what Satan is doing. You're going to find out that Satan was the first evangelist. Uh, he had his own gospel, the devil's gospel. He came to Eve and told Eve how to be godlike. <laughs> He's an evangelist. And Eve was his first convert. And he had, in order to get Eve to believe a lie, he had what I want to call today four spiritual flaws. Now, you know our friend Bill Bright has written a little gospel track that I suppose all of us have seen and most of us who have been soul winners have used it one time or another and I still use called the four spiritual laws. What are they? God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. That's law number one. Number two, man is a sinner and he's separated from God and thus he cannot know and experience God's love and plan for his life. Law number three, Jesus Christ is God's provision for man's sin and Jesus died on the cross to take away our sin. That's law number four. Law number five, we must personally and individually receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Then we can know and experience God's love and plan for our life. It's a wonderful gospel track, and we call that the four spiritual laws. Erwin Lutzer has said, yes, but they're also flaws. And I want to borrow that phrase from Erwin, the four spiritual flaws. I want you to see what the devil did to corrupt Eve, and I want you to see what the devil will do to corrupt you. And if you're not a Christian today, pay attention now, because the devil has deceived you. You say, well, he hasn't deceived me. Yes, he has. Revelation 12, verse 9 says, He deceives the whole world. And all of us were deceived by the devil until we came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, his motive is murder. He wants you to be his victim. His method is the lie. He would deceive you today. And if he doesn't deceive you, he'd just try to get you to tune out so that you don't hear what we're talking about. Four things that Satan did to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Look, if you will, in chapter 3 and verse 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. The word subtle means crafty and sly. More subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Spiritual flaw number one is to despise God's goodness and to think negatively about God. To think negatively about God. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to think negatively about God. Satan came crawling his slimy, corroding path into the pages of history. and He said, did God say, that you shall not eat of the fruit of every tree of the garden? Now, what was that? It was an attempt to get Eve to doubt God's goodness, God's love, God's amazing grace. He wanted Eve to think negatively about God. What it was was a slander on the character of God. It was Satan's way of saying God is not good. God is some sort of a cosmic killjoy. God doesn't want you to have all of this good fruit. Now, of course, that was a lie. God had not said that she could not eat of that fruit. As a matter of fact, just put in your margin, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden, listen to this, thou mayest freely eat. It's there, it's for you. Adam, Eve, I made it for you. Help yourself. But what did Satan say? Oh, hath God said, ye shall not eat of the fruit of every tree of the garden. The truth of the matter is, there was only one tree that they were forbidden to take up, but 
What Satan was trying to do was to get Eve to think negatively about God. God is so straight-laced. God is so cruel that any time he sees anyone having any pleasure, he just sort of moves in to, to break up the party. Everything good and pleasurable is a no-no. Um, the truth of the matter is that God has said a resounding yes to your pleasure. God loves you. Don't get the idea that being a Christian is some sort of a penalty that you pay in order to get to heaven. I would be a Christian if there were no heaven. There is. I would be a Christian if there were no hell, just to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Can you imagine what all God made for Adam and Eve? Can you imagine the glories, the splendor of Eden, what it must have been like? The most beautiful place you've ever seen would not even begin to compare with Eden. And God made it for Adam and Eve, and God said, help yourself. They tell a little story of Cain and Abel after Adam and Eve had been put out of the garden because of their sin. Cain and Abel came to a wall, climbed, over, climbed up that wall and looked over and saw Eden, went back to Adam and said, Daddy, we have just seen the most beautiful place in the world. Hey, hey, Dad, do you think we could ever live in a place like that? Adam said, we did once, boys, before your mother ate us out of house and home. <laughs> well, it was a, a beautiful and a glorious place, and God made it. And God said to Adam, and God said to Eve, help yourself. Do you know what the devil will do to many of you? He will put negative thoughts in your heart concerning the goodness of our God. Listen to Psalm 37 in verse 4. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desire of your heart. Listen to Psalm 84, verse 11. The Lord thy God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Now listen to this. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Isn't that great? No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. The Bible says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. But now listen to this. But in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. The living God, who has given to us richly all things to enjoy. The dirty devil wants you to think negatively about God. Now listen to me. God is good all of the time. And anything that causes pain and suffering and moan and moan and groan and woe and heartache and tears is the fruit of sin. It is not because of God. God made a beautiful, wonderful paradise, and he put man and woman in that paradise. And so Satan's spiritual flaw, number one, is to get you to doubt the goodness of God and to think negatively about God. And friend, it's a foolish thing if you think negatively about our great God who has given us richly all things to enjoy. When I invite you to Jesus Christ, I'm not inviting you to a funeral. I'm inviting you to a feast to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Spiritual flaw number two. Uh, spiritual flaw number two is to deny God's truthfulness and to think skeptically about God. Now notice verses 2 and 3. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Eve knew better than that. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. You know how I think he said it? I wasn't there, but I, you know how I think he said it? He shall not surely die. I mean, what he, what, what he is doing here is, is uh, denying God's truthfulness. How do you know that you're going to surely die? And what he did was to make a skeptic, to make a doubter about God's truthfulness. You see, what he did, first of all, was to question God's goodness. And now he is questioning God's truthfulness. Now, I want to say this. Anybody who causes a question mark concerning the Word of God or anybody who denies the veracity and the truth of, of the Word of God is doing the work of the devil. 
I don't care what university he teaches in or what uh, seminary he may teach in. I, don't, I care not how many degrees he has after his name. If he inculcates in the hearts and minds of anybody a doubt or a denial of the Word of God, that man is an emissary of Satan. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Yea, hath, hath God said, ye shall not eat? Oh, come on, you will not surely die. <laughs> oh, no. Why? Your eyes will be open. You see, modern man today will do anything except believe the truth. We have so many substitutes for the truth. We have today uh, uh, relativism. Hegel, the philosopher, began relativism in our society. And, and so everything is, is relative. And our kids are going to school today uh, being taught there are no absolutes. All truth is relative truth. And if that doesn't go, then others, and especially in some churches today, uh, have been given to subjectivism. Not relativism, but subjectivism. They say, well, uh, this is what I feel is truth. This is what I think. This is, is what it means to me. And, well, what is true for me may not be true for you, but isn't it wonderful that we all have our own truth? And that's, that's subjectivism. Truth is what we experience. And, and for others, the answer is not necessarily relativism or subjectivism, but uh, rationalism. They somehow have the idea that uh, all that is truth is what we call empirical truth, what they can put into the laboratory. They, if they can put God in a, in a, in a test tube, uh, then they might believe in God. Puny man thinks that he can prove God through rationalism, and so he substitutes, thus saith the mind of man, for thus saith the word of God. And another substitute for God's truth is pragmatism, and this is the one that's working in America today. In America today, we don't ask, is it true? We want to know, does it work? Does it work? And so uh, we're not all that interested in pragmatism. But you know, the most uh, damning assault on truth today is a word you may not have heard much, in, uh, much but if you've, been in, uh, if you've read or been in theology, you hear this word, and it's postmodernism. What on earth is postmodernism? You say, Pastor, I've been longing all morning to hear something about postmodernism. <laughs> postmodernism, these folks, they don't believe there is a truth. They won't argue about truth to you because that's, it's not even an issue with them. It's just uh, there is no real truth. And so it's, it's a hodgepodge of all of these other things that I've talked about uh, rationalism and relativism and emotionalism and, and all of these things. But when they finally finish, they just simply say, nobody knows truth and never has been truth, never will be truth. We make up truth as we go along. Now, that kind of thinking, which is one of Satan's spiritual flaws, leaves people with no rational basis as to say what is right and what is wrong. And that's we're still thinking about the kids in the high schools these days. What has happened in America? Well, one thing, there's a famine for the Word of God. There's a famine for the Word of God. If you listened to James Dobson, you heard the program that was a replay of the National Day of Prayer. And one of those speakers there in the Cannon Office building, he talked about Pavlov, P-A-V-L-O-V, the Russian who uh, worked with animals in what we call conditioned response. That is, he could... He would ring a bell and feed the dogs, and the dogs would salivate uh, after a while just at the ringing of a bell because they associated the ringing of a bell with food. But another thing Pavlov did was this, and I'd not heard this before. He would put a dog down and over here and put in front of the dog a perfect circle. And uh, when the dog would see the perfect circle, he taught the dog to jump to the right. And if the dog would see the circle and jump to the right, the dog would be rewarded. And so the dog learned, circle, jump, food. And then after he got the dog trained this way, he put in front of the dog an oval. Not a circle, but an oval. And then at the sign of the oval, he taught the dog to jump to the left. Jump to the left, oval, food. Circle, jump to the right, reward. And the dog was trained this way. And the dog had it down perfectly. And then Pavlov began to do something. He began to take the circle 
and morph it just a little bit so it began to look like an oval. He took the oval and began to change it a little bit so it looked like a circle. And the dog was getting confused and still trying as best he could to get the reward and to do what was right. And finally, Pavlov had a figure on the ground that the dog could not tell whether it was a circle or an oval. And the dog went mad. Now, folks, that's where our kids are today. They don't know whether it's a circle or an oval. They do not know that there is a fixed standard because that dirty devil has gotten people to think skeptically about God and cannot believe the fixed Word of God. Parents are having difficulty today raising children. Well, let me tell you how to raise them. Child is wrong to steal because God says so. It's wrong to commit adultery because God says so. You're to obey your parents because God says so. We're to worship one God because God says so. But if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Now, here's the third spiritual flaw. First of all, he wanted Satan, Satan wanted Eve to think negatively about God, to doubt the goodness of God. Secondly, he wanted Eve to think skeptically about God and, and to doubt the truthfulness of God. Thirdly, third spiritual flaw, a flaw was to defy God's righteousness and to think carelessly about God. To think carelessly about God. Look in verse 4 again. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. That is, Eve, you don't have to worry about judgment. I mean, you can be cavalier about this thing, uh, you don't need to fear God. God is not all that righteous. Now, don't worry about God's laws. But friend, God is righteous. God is holy. Not only is God good, but God is righteous. God will punish sin. God had forbidden them to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, in the day that you eat thereof, you will die. That was God's holy law. And law without penalty is only advice. And God wasn't giving advice. You see, it's, it's the devil's gospel, the devil's gospel that God will not punish sin. But God sent me here to tell you that God is a holy God, God is a righteous God, and God will punish sin. And whatever happened to hell, if you disobey God and refuse the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. You're going to die and go to hell. There is a hell. You say, well, pastor, today people don't believe in hell anymore. Well, that doesn't change it at all. Jesus Christ had more to say about hell than any preacher in the Word of God. Jesus Christ, the loving Jesus, had more to say about hell than any other preacher in the Word of God. Abraham Lincoln, who was wise in homey ways, said to a little boy one time, said, son, I want to ask you a question. If a dog has four legs and you call his tail a leg, then how many legs would he have? The little boy said he'd have five, and Abe said, no, he'll only have four. No matter what you call his tail, it's still a tail. <laughs> you can call his tail a leg if you want to, but he only has four legs, and no matter what people say about hell, they do not uh, take away God's truth concerning the punishment of sin. Now, uh, Satan knows that man fears death. Satan knows that. So he says to Eve, you will not surely die. And by the way, I said, you know, this is not new or old. It's, it's up to date. It's all new age religion. Everything that I have given you, everything is all new age religion. How do the new agers deal with this idea, you, shall not, uh, you, you will not surely die? Well, it's reincarnation. What is reincarnation? Well, you just, you just keep going around and around. You get recycled. You get as many chances at perfection as you need. And in reincarnation, there's no judgment. There's no personal God. You know who the high priestess of, of this New Age religion is? Her name is Shirley MacLaine, uh, an actress of sorts. She's, she said, listen to this, and I quote her, we can eliminate all fear of death. And she said she had discovered that once she was a princess in Atlantis, and then she was uh, an Inca, in Peru, and then one time she was a child raised by elephants. That's in her past lives that she's had. And, and you know, 
As Shirley MacLaine said, it's like show business. You keep doing it until you get it right. And so there are a lot of kids today who, uh, while they cannot be taught uh, biblical truth, they are, the, this uh, Eastern mysticism and New Ageism has come in like gangbusters into the church, and they believe that. And, uh, and the idea is that we have something called karma, K-A-R-M-A, and if your karma is good, you, next time you go through, you keep on going up and you get higher and higher and higher. But if your karma is bad, you, you, you're degraded in the next life. So, so you just keep going through and through. And that's the reason many of them are vegetarians. Because they believe that animals and humans are all interrelated. And so when you go to McDonald's, you might be eating your grandmother. And so <laughs> they believe this. That that cow has been reincarnated from something else and reincarnated. And, and so, this is what they believe. Satan. Satan does not want people to believe that there is a death and a holy and a righteous God and a judgment to face. And so, the, you come up with these silly ideas like reincarnation. People don't like the idea of judgment, and they're glad to listen to this third spiritual flaw that you can uh, deny the righteousness of God and think carelessly about God. Do you know one of the worst things people say about preachers today? He's a hellfire preacher, hellfire and damnation preacher. Like, you don't want to go there to hear him. I want to say again, you would not have wanted to hear Jesus. I have an idea. I have a suspicion. It's almost a conviction. If the Supreme Court of the United States of America could vote on it, they would outlaw hell as cruel and unusual punishment. They would say, oh, that's certainly an un-American thing. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot have eternal punishment. You see, this is a lie out of hell. The devil wants you to think negatively about God. The devil wants you to think skeptically about God. The devil wants you to think casually and lightly about God. Fourth spiritual flaw is this, that Satan debases God's greatness and he wants you to think suspiciously about God. He wants you to think suspiciously about God. Now, notice how clever he was. Uh, look in verse 5, for God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, ha, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as God knowing good and evil. Now, you know what he's saying here? Look, you can't trust God. <laughs> Eve, you're a babe in the woods. Your eyes are not even open. You don't know what's right. You don't know what's wrong. You don't know what's good. You don't know what's bad. All you have is his word for it. That's all you have is his word for it. You've never experienced it. How do you know it's bad? How do you know? After all, Eve, experience is the best teacher. Have you ever heard that? Experience is the best teacher. So we get the idea today that in order to find out whether something is good or bad, we have to experiment with it. That's the reason why so many young people have their lives that are wrecked and ruined and are sucked down in the swirling sewers of sin because of experimentation. And so, you know, I, I, I want to experiment a little bit with drugs. I want to ex experiment a little with Eastern meditation. I want to experience, I experiment a little bit with uh, premarital sex. I want to experiment a little bit with sexual perversion. I mean, just try it, Eve. You might like it. Hey, Eve, if it's good, then you can do it some more. If it's bad, you don't have to do it anymore. But Eve, your eyes are not even open. Why, listen, if you do it, then your eyes will be open. You'll be like he is. You will know the difference between good and bad. You see, he's got a monopoly on being God. <laughs> he's trying to head you off at the pass. He doesn't want you to have fulfillment. He, he doesn't want you to be liberated. He wants to keep you under his thumb. 
He experiences the best teacher, not somebody's word. Let me tell you something, folks. When it comes to sin, experience is a very poor teacher. And those who know the least about sin are those who are the deepest into it. Did you know that? The Bible speaks of the deceitfulness of sin. The deceitfulness of sin. And those who know the very least about sin are those who have been blinded and they're into sin, and they come to the place where they get a reprobate mind. They cannot tell up from down, good for bad. They put bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter, light for darkness, darkness for light, good for evil, evil for good, because they try to make themselves the sum, the substance, the, the, the total uh, decider of what is good and bad. And folks, I'm going to tell you, the world is full of that today. These kids who are ruining their lives through experimentation, one young lady was trying to induce another young lady to sacrifice her purity upon the altar of some man's lust and become the dirty plaything of somebody. And she was saying, well, everybody's doing it. Why don't you do it? And the young girl who was being tempted was a virgin, pure, somebody who knew what God's Word says, that you're to save yourself for the one that you marry. You say, well, I'm not married yet. It's not adultery. Friend, the Bible calls it fornication, and the Bible forbids it, and it's adultery against the one you're going to marry. Against the one you're going to marry. But this person was saying, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Everybody's doing it. And this young, pure girl said to this girl who was trying to get her to experiment with sex, so let me tell you something. Anytime I want to become like you, I can be. I can, but anytime you would again like to be like me, you never can. You never can. But you see, the devil, the devil is trying to get everybody into this experimenting. Eve, try it. The devil knows that in the day that you eat, then your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. Now, remember what I told you? That the best lie sounds the most like the truth. I mean, you think about it. Eve is not trying, Adam, Satan is not trying to get Eve to steal or to kill or to commit adultery or to use narcotics. Do you know what the bait is that he's using? He says, hey, I want to show you how to be like God. You'll be as God. That sounds so much like being like God, doesn't it? But there's a big difference between being as God and being like God. <laughs> you will be as God. That is, you will be your own God. And folks, again, that's the new age. That's the new age. Do you know what Eastern religion teaches? That we're all gods. You see, they teach pantheism. Everything is God. The animals are God. The plants are God. The air is God. The stars are God. The earth is God. You are God. Everything is God. Now, you think that elevates you? That doesn't elevate you because you and the animals share divinity. Uh, that just brings you down to the level of an animal. Listen, uh, they would say that love is God. No, love is not God. God is love. You see, there's a difference. Uh, they, they, they have the idea that everything is God. No, everything is not God. There's one God. He is distinct and different from everything else, and he is the one that we worship. But here is what uh, the devil is saying to Eve. Eve, you can be your own little cheap tin God. And I am telling you, there are millions of Americans who look at their God every morning when they shave in the mirror. That is their God. They want to become independent, autonomous, do their own thing. Nobody else telling them what to do, what to think, what to believe. They are like God, knowing good and evil. And they're going to die and be eternally lost because they're the devil's convert listening to the devil's four spiritual flaws. You think about it. Our kids today, Easter, we can't celebrate Easter in our schools anymore, but I'll tell you what we can do. I'll tell you what we can do. We can have Earth Day. Earth Day. What do well, you think about it? I mean, if you believe that everything is sort of God, then the stars are God, the animals are God, man is God, the dirt is God. Then if, if the dirt is God, then God is dirt. And if you're God, you're dirt. 
You're dirt. That doesn't elevate you. That dehumanizes you. But you see, this lie sounds just so much like the truth. You will be as God. No, God's plan is for us to be like God. He made us in His image, in His image. And he is working toward that plan until one day, even though we're fallen, redeemed, we'll rise in his likeness and we'll be like him forever. And, and the Bible, the psalmist said, I shall be satisfied when I awaken in thy likeness. Isn't it, isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how that people today buy in to these four spiritual flaws where the devil gets them? And some are listening right here. You've been thinking negatively about God. You've been running from God. Why would you run from somebody who loves you? You've been thinking negatively about God. Then you've been thinking skeptically about God. You've been wondering, is this really, really true? Is this really true? And then you've been thinking lightly about God. And you say, oh, well, <laughs> if I do wrong, he's a loving God. He's too good to punish sin. He's too good not to punish sin. Amen. He's a holy and a righteous God. And then you, then you think, well... You know, if I, if I give my heart to him, if I, if, I, if I truly receive Christ as my personal Savior, then that'll just head me off at the pass. I can never be all that I ought to be. I can never reach my full potential. No, friend, you will never reach your full potential without Jesus, without knowing him, without loving him. Have you listened to the devil's lies? All of us have it sometimes. Well, there's another passage, and we won't turn to it, but I love it over in Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. And the Bible there in verse 9 speaks of that old dragon, the serpent, or that old serpent, the dragon, that old serpent. We saw him way back here in the Garden of Eden. Now he is over here in, in the book of the Revelation. And by the way, there are two books in the Bible the devil doesn't like. You know what they are? Genesis and Revelation. Because in Genesis, his, his doom is announced and in Revelation, it's carried out. And thank God there's no devil in the first two or the last two chapters of the Bible. Amen? Amen. But over there, it says this. That old serpent was cast out, and his angels were cast out with him. And listen to this. It says this. Here's how to overcome him. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. That's the way to overcome the old liar, the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Say amen. The blood of the Lamb. Thank God for Calvary. Thank God that Jesus, the last Adam, undid what the first Adam did on that cross. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And, and it's because Jesus died for you that you can be saved. And then the word of their testimony. They were not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and of my word, I'll be ashamed of you when I come in the glory of the Father with the holy angels. And then it says, and here's the main thing, listen to me. I wouldn't say it's the main thing, the climactic thing. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Now that doesn't mean they kept on loving Jesus until they died. That's not what that means. It, that may be true, but that's not what that means. It means this, that they loved Jesus Christ and would serve him if they had to die for their faith. Would you die for your faith? And do you no longer afraid to die? You're not ready to live. And you may, if you're a true Christian, have to die for your faith, the way things are changing. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Folks, it's time we stop playing games. And it's time we stop listening to lies. The devil is a liar. The four spiritual laws are these. God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. The, the second is that sin has separated us from God. The third is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for our sins on the cross. The fourth is if we will receive him as our personal Lord and Savior, then we can know and experience God's love and God's plan for our lives. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you already know the Lord Jesus Christ, would you begin to pray for those round about you who may not yet know him? Just pray, Lord, if that person sitting next to me is not saved, open their heart. Surely somebody's praying for you right now if you're not saved. 
And I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. But if you want to be saved, here's what you can do. You can pray a prayer like this. Dear God, I'm a sinner. And I'm lost. And I need to be saved and I want to be saved. Jesus, you died to save me. You promised to save me if I would trust you. I do trust you, Jesus. Would you tell him that? Tell him, just tell him, Lord, I trust you. I bring my sin, my weakness, my doubt. I bring it all, Lord, just to you. And I trust you. Come into my heart. Forgive, forgive my sin. Cleanse me. Save me, Jesus. Pray it from your heart. Did you ask him? Then pray this. Thank you for doing it. I don't look for a sign. I don't ask for a feeling. I stand on your word. You cannot lie. Thank you, Jesus, for paying for my sin with your blood on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. And now because you died for me, I will live for you. And I will not be ashamed of you. I will make it public. And I will do it today. I will do it today. In your name I pray. Amen. Friend, as we conclude this message, may I ask you a very personal question, a very pertinent question. Are you saved? I didn't ask if you were religious, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, or anything else. Do you know Jesus Christ? Is he a bright living reality in your life? If not, I've got good news. You can receive him today as your Lord and Savior, and he will save you instantaneously. He'll be with you continually, and he will keep you eternally. Pray like this, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Save me, Lord Jesus. Pray it and mean it. And if you do, write to us and let us know so we can rejoice, and we'll send you some literature to help you get started in your Christian life. We hope that today's message has been an encouragement to you as we explore these fundamentals of the Christian faith with Adrian Rogers. You can stream this message again and download Pastor Rogers' outlines and notes on this message all at lwf.org or the My LWF app. While you're there, be sure to check out our new Bible studies on these same topics, as well as Pastor Rogers' audio series, Back to the Basics, also available at lwf.org. At lwf.org, you can also sign up to receive our daily heartbeat email, which includes a written devotional and a 90-second inspirational audio clip, both from Adrian Rogers, as well as a link to our daily radio program delivered directly to your computer or mobile device each morning. And if you're looking for some inspiration or encouragement to get you through the week, check us out on social media at LWF Ministries. And don't forget, you can catch up with our program each week on our Facebook page or YouTube channel or on the My LWF app. Thanks for joining us for our program today. We'll see you next time. At Love Worth Finding, our mission is to help Christians grow deeper in their faith through the timeless teachings of Adrian Rogers. And to thank you for your gift to the ministry this month, we want to send you a copy of our new Discover Jesus Mentoring Tool. This one-on-one -on -one mentoring version of the popular book is designed to help you and a friend grow in your faith together. Call with your gift at 1-800-647-9400 or you can give online at lwf.org.